So, so happy to be here. Full disclosure, I am now the singular object that stands between you and lunch. <laughs> that said, okay, let's use one of our school readiness catchwords, resiliency. Let's be resilient and maybe pop a Reese's peanut butter cup in our mouths, <laughs> okay? Be a little resilient here, let's buckle up, okay? And we've got a few minutes left and uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to lunch. So thanks for being here. I am excited to be here. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Ann Casey Foundation, the uh, Georgia grade level reading campaign, the Georgia Family Connection Partnership, the Atlanta Speech School with Comer, uh, and Commissioner Cagle. Uh, this is just a tremendous event, and I am so thrilled that there is this continuum that will occur after the event. So I think that's awesome. So I have this beautiful scenic view of, uh, of a cliff up here for a reason. You see that person on the end there? You can kind of just make that person out. Let's pretend you're them. And let me ask you a question. How many of you, being that person up there, would jump off this cliff without a parachute or a safety net? Come on, raise your hands, nice and high, how many? Okay, for the record, that would be no one, okay? And there's a reason for that, right? There's no safety net, there's no parachute. Metaphorically speaking, okay, let's pretend that that parachute represents school readiness. It represents the important skills that every child needs, right? And yet we are asking children in this state and in states across the country to make a leap of faith to formal schooling without that safety net or parachute, AKA school readiness. Okay, this is a systemic problem, and it's not just happening here. I'm sitting in a, I'm here with, in a room with all the best people in the state of Georgia. This is phenomenal, and I love the continuum that's gonna take place. I'm not telling you something you don't know, but here's what I think we have to do. I think we need to label this thing as something bigger. And what we have is an epidemic talking with Brenda before, often we talk about epidemics in terms of medical terms, right? We don't often talk about it in terms of learning. But I think if we want to understand what our job is and what we're up against, we need to look at this as an epidemic. We also need to think of it as with a name. Now this sounds pretty clunky, chronic school unpreparedness. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? But school and readiness is also, I don't know if that's even grammatically correct. But the bottom line is, is that children here in the state of Georgia are chronically unprepared for school. That's the bottom line, is they're unprepared here and across the country. So why is that? What are the root causes? Well, we have gaps, okay? We have a literacy gap. That's the one we've been talking about, and that's the one we know all too well in this room. Scholastic talks about it vocabulary, and so on. So this is uh, a major issue, okay? The other two gaps are around social, emotional, as well as resiliency, okay? Resiliency and the nurture gap. So when I talk about nurture, I don't mean that children aren't loved by their parents, that parents don't love their children. I mean that we need to help instill in families creative ways so they can build children's self-esteem. Right? So much of this is about not only the building blocks of literacy that children don't have, the books in the home that they don't have, the vocabulary deficit that they do have, but it's about nurturing and it's about resiliency. Kids feeling good about themselves. Kids proceeding on task. So what can we do to help families build capacity? And what exactly is capacity? What are we talking about? How are we going to really execute something? How are we going to pull this off? Well, capacity for me means building a culture of reading and learning in that family familiar structure in every community in Georgia and across the country. This is critical. And frankly, families are the common denominator to basically close the literacy gap. They're the common denominator, particularly at the early years, zero to five, to close the resiliency as well as the nurture gaps, because if we do these things, parents are gonna help us have school success the most important, student success, excuse me. But the most important thing is it's not just about families, it's about, I heard someone say it earlier, it's about the adults, the meaningful adults in all of the environments that touch that young learner. So the next slide, which will come up, is, you know, 
What do we need to do? How do we scale this? What's the important thing? What are the two key issues that we need to do, okay? The first one is execution, okay? The bottom line is we need to take the right materials. We know what the right materials are. We know what we need to do for families, okay? We need to have the right materials, the right tools, in the right hands, and it needs to be synthesized. I heard someone earlier talk about synthesis, coherence. What's going to be the plan? There it is, execution, okay? Scholastic does a, a number of great things. We have a program called Read and Rise for Family Literacy, a great new program called iRead, gets kids to, to grade level reading proficiency by grade three. We also have books, book flicks, web-based delivery of children's storybooks, fiction and nonfiction, helps kids learn how to read, and, and it actually teaches people English. But here's the game changer, scale, right? We're going to have these meetings, and hopefully at some point you'll invite me back, but you're going to get to a place where you're going to say, this is what we know we need to do. This is our integrated solution. Okay, how do you scale that? to more than five kids, to more than 50 kids, to 5,000, 50,000, 500,000. We can do it now, and here's why. Ubiquity. Now, I'm not gonna spout hyperbole and say, oh, everyone's got a device today, but here's something interesting I think you'll find very interesting, okay? Nielsen recently did a study in the, in the uh, uh, 18 to 24 age group, okay? 56% of the poorest people, those making $15,000 and less, 56% of those people have smartphones, have adopted smartphones. Here's the really here's the amazing part. There's only a 9% delta from the poorest to the wealthiest in that age group, 18 to 24. So you have 56% over here that have adopted smart technology as of today, not, not tomorrow, that's now. And 64%, 65%, excuse me, that are in the upper income stratas that have adopted SMART. 9% is the difference. So this idea that the haves and the have-nots are totally divergent in terms of SMART technology is not there. I've got to hurry up. <laughs> but I have a little bit of time I did notice. So the bottom line is that technology is not the be-all and end-all. We have ubiquity. We have delivery. We're going to be able to reach people. Here's what this does, okay? And I'm sure every one of you will, 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 will find this meaningful. Technology through mobile gives us a lifeline to every person we could never reach before. It gives us, if 56% of the poorest people today have smart technology, what about next week? What about six months from now? These rates are happening consistently much faster than we would, than we would uh, need them to happen. So it adds unprecedented opportunities for us to establish a beachhead with all the people out there that were unreachable before. Unprecedented in size and scope. Lastly, I want to give you a window into the future. Okay, and the future is not far, is not far ahead of us. It's here. We can do these things now. I want you to think about, as we talk about parents and children and what they can do, and the parents that have maybe limits with their language or being a struggling <coughs> reader or no reader at all. We have these voices. And the voice basically allows for a meaningful exchange between the parent and child. There's a voice for the child, and there's a voice for the parent. And the voice for the child is the one that we've always had. When we want a child to engage in a book, it's an engaging, uh, maybe it's a book, maybe it's some sort of really fun thing that they can do that's literacy-based. But here's the really important and cool thing. The voice for the parent can be intuitive, direct, instruction. It can be things that parents can do. It can prompt a, a, a parent. It can take a parent who cannot read, who has a language barrier, and prompt them verbally. And at the end of the day, here's the irony. We talk about, we debate about the effectiveness and the eff efficacy of technology at young ages. Technology, in this case, it's meant to do the things that we know is so critical. Provoke those meaningful transactions between parents and children. We're just going to give parents who never had the capacity before the opportunity to do these very special things. And then we can all see the goal of school readiness happen. So thank you so much for having me today.